Welcome to the Earth's Edge podcast. I'm your host, James McManus. At Earth's Edge, we run guided expeditions with a focus on environmental and cultural sustainability. We created this podcast to share stories from people who have found the outdoors and fallen in love with adventure. Each month, we're giving away one of our summit jackets worth 150 euro. To be in the running, all you need to do is subscribe to our mailing list at earths-edge.com forward slash podcast. There's a link in the show notes. Now for today's guest. You know how you get that like change of perspective when you're on a trip? Like I never really experienced that before. It's just kind of bullying through life and you know, always kind of going on from one thing to the next. And I found that taking that time away for myself just made me so much stronger, better as a mom, better as a daughter, better as a business owner. Today, I chat with Debbie Mulhall, who has completed Machu Picchu, Kilimanjaro, Everest Base Camp, Aconcagua, Stuck Angry, and Elbrus. That's a mouthful of trips. If you're someone who thinks you're too busy to take on that big trip because of work or family commitments, you need to hear Debbie's story. Debbie also tells us what it's like being the only woman on an expedition and how she's already planning her next big adventure. We start out chatting about her early years before she got into the outdoors and how she's managing it all now. So let's jump in there. So growing up in Offaly was fine. Um, I did leave Offaly when I was 17, lived a little while in Kerry, a little while in Cork. And then I moved to the States when I was 20 and I was there until I was 29. So wow. I moved home about nine years ago. Okay. And I live here, I live in Offaly now. I think I appreciate living in the Midlands and in Tullamore a lot more now than I did when I was younger. Yeah, I, yeah, I can relate to that. Like I'm from, I like to yeah. tell people I'm from Tipperary, but like still the Midlands, you know, but I'm not quite a biffo like yourself. So that's something to be proud of, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you take many adventures growing up? Like, did you go on many adventures as a kid? Honestly, we did not. No, we didn't. Um, probably like a lot of families, we did the West Coast. We grandparents from Galway and that was pretty much it. Throw you into the car, eat the sandwiches with the sand, dry your shorts, hanging out of the windows coming home. And yeah, that was it. The really the only time I ever traveled was probably when I went to the States. And Yeah. So come here, you went to the States for when you're 20. Like what what was going on over there? Like you, you told me before you started a business. Tell us about that. Like uh yeah, so I was literally just going over for a wedding, went over with um, a couple of really good friends and a boyfriend at the time. We went for a wedding. And I think we were like maybe landed about 24 hours when we both got handed separate bartending jobs in like aunties and uncles bars in New York. And that was literally the start to the end. And we just didn't come home. Wow. And what was that like? Sounds like it just must be an outrageous fun. Like, do you know what? At the time, at the time that it was, it was we were living the dream for sure. But like New York is just one of those places like when it, it eventually just kind of burns out and, and when it was time to come home, it was time to come home. But we had a ball. Like we got really loads of opportunities, got to travel all over the States, did almost everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. And did you do any hiking or trekking when you are in the States? No, I was doing way too much other stuff that would really hinder hiking. <laughs> yeah, so that was like one of the biggest things I probably would regret. And if I go back and spend any time there, I'll try and go and do the Rockies and stuff. We didn't do any mountains, any hiking, anything like that when we were there. A lot of city visits, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of partying that you probably don't want to talk about. I Listen, I can relate to that, you know, I like, I like a good party myself as well, so... <laughs> So you came home and you set up um, Urban Beauty. Like that's a pretty big established uh, business now at this stage. Like talk, talk to me about that journey. Like where, how did it start and where is uh, bringing up to where it is now? Do, do you know what, James? Honestly, Urba, if I was to say to you that it was my dream to open like this big skin clinic and have all this success and be a businesswoman and everything, um, if I said that that was in my head or that was a plan, I'd be telling you absolute lies. It all just unfolded. Um, I did have a business that is not related to skin or beauty at all when I was in the States. And when I returned home, I was in uh, uh, bar and uh, food industry when I came home. I was pretty um, pretty sure I didn't want to do that here in Ireland. I just had my little girl. She's nine now, but she was only a couple of months at the time. When I returned home, it was a little bit of a like, it was a crazy time for me because it was a massive adjustment. Um, I was a single parent back in Ireland. All my friends had like grown up with their kids, kind of settled down. And I kind of landed home at 
29 going, sugar, where am I, what am I going to do now? Um, but yeah, I think after a few months of home, I kind of just had a little look around at what maybe I could do something differently. And I kind of went back to college and yeah, honestly started from me working freelance part time while I had two other jobs. And um, yeah, been very, very lucky. The business has grown like exponentially since then, you know, it's fell into it literally, yeah. Yeah, so you started the business while Bryn was like basically an infant and you that's the time you started her up. Yeah, she was in nappies, yeah. So I had clients come to the spare bedroom and they would call in and uh, I would just kind of do them from my house. And uh, soon I realized, I suppose I kind of got busy enough that I thought, well, if I could find somewhere that my child wasn't breaking down the door, <laughs> yeah. that might be helpful. Um, so yeah, I took a sublet in Tumore. Just literally started off with a room and then a year later I had uh, decided to take on somebody and then later that year we took a couple more rooms and then we ended up about two and a half years in decided I was going to extend the business to Athlone so the first business was in Tullamore so I had I was open about two and a half years in Tullamore and then I opened Irva in Athlone and that has just grown for me so much since then yeah so we've been open in Athlone for about five years now yeah, like fair play to you. Like you've grown a huge business. Like as you said there yourself, like with a young child and a single mom, it's it's really impressive. Like, do you think that skill set and being really tough and being able to like set something up and being self driven has like transferred? Is that skills that you've used on on some of the big mountains you've climbed? Yes, and likewise, probably some of the skills I picked up on the mountain, I transferred back into the business. If that makes any sense. But, yeah. yeah. Talk to me about that a little bit more, like. I suppose you mean with regards to how the mountain would have benefited me in other areas like the business and whatnot. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose, John, like, you know what I'm like with the phone and social media and stuff. And I do get it very, very hard to switch off. And I think it came as a big surprise when I did do that very first trip, how much I liked the disconnection from the, you know, the real world and the stress of everything. So that was big for me to learn how important it was to actually stop. And just, you know how you get that like, change of perspective when you're on a trip like I never really experienced that before I was just kind of bulling through life and you know always kind of going on from one thing to the next and I found that taking that time away for myself just made me so much stronger better as a mom better as a daughter better as a business owner um, and I learned I actually learned a lot about people and I learned a lot about interacting with people and um, different how different people respond to even my personality or looking at the dynamics of groups like that stuff that was invaluable bringing that mm. back into um, a management position because I never had staff before you know John and that was probably the biggest challenge was people and I, I learned a lot the trips actually gave me a huge amount of that's even aside from all the yeah like getting you know setting goals and training for something and building up to something and then trying to conquer this mountain and having failures along the way and all the successes and yeah all that stuff it all kind of transferred back it's just been amazing cool yeah no I, I definitely can resonate with a lot of what you're saying you know I think um I find myself like regardless of where, where I go which mountain I'm climbing or which track you know it's just the simplicity of life on the on the trail you know and everything just kind of slows down and even for me when I'm guiding as opposed to being a client on a trip I find the same thing it's just it's just a really chill environment and <laughs> Everything is simple and you've got so much time to chat to people and learn about people where you don't have a phone in your hand and you're not distracted. It's just, you know, all that noise of life is stopped. So it's just like an absolutely class environment. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place with this podcast, but come here. So let's go back a few steps. Tell me, like, was the trip to Machu Picchu with myself and Pat, like, was that the first internet, like track you'd done? Yeah, it really was. Mm -hmm. And what made you like sign up to it? Like, what, where, how did you find it? Or what was the, what was the catalyst for you going on that trip? I was basically, was working really hard. Probably had a few pounds saved up, but all my friends were, as I said, married or if there was anyone going on holidays, they were going to do like a big mad drinking holiday in the sun. And while I loved that, I was definitely looking for something different. And um, holy moly, if I'd only known <laughs> what I was going to get when I signed up for that trip, but uh, yeah, that Machu Picchu trip was, it was the catalyst for <laughs> all the fun stuff that came after. It's pretty epic. Yeah. yeah, actually, like, you know, you talk about not going on drinking trips, but I mean, I, I, I specifically remember trying to drag some of you guys out of the nightclub <laughs> in Costco at the end of that trip. I was like, guys, come on, it's not a drinking trip. And I obviously wasn't drinking myself and generally acting like a saint, you know, but... Uh, I'm sorry, did you just say you weren't drinking? Yeah, exactly. That's right. what I said. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. 
myself and the doctor Barry, he's a really good friend of mine working on that one. We we had to come and fish you guys out, you know. Oh, okay. No, yeah, like so come here, let's that trip, like what are your memories of that trip? Like it was it was a great group, like we met some cool people on that one. There was so many big characters. Like what are what are your thoughts on it? James, that was definitely one of the greatest trips. Um I think like that group that Pat brought together at that time was epic. Now, every group I've been on, I don't want to say that there was one more epic than the other. Just that one in particular, the dynamics were amazing. I am still in close contact with about five or six of the girls and guys from that trip. And when I say in close contact, we, we chat almost every day. I became very good friends with um, Jill and Alexia and Sarah. I mean, we've traveled, we've traveled all over the world together, even since that, you know. I can't even put it into words. We did so much together since and... Uh, it was my first one and it definitely made me realize that it was something that I wanted to do more of. And yeah, it was, it was just, it was really, really great. So good. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Because you, you meet people like kind of who are like minded and, and have the, the gumption to go and do something a little bit different. And I find that a lot like with, you know, even myself, like with, with mates that I would have gone adventures with when I was younger that have, you know, set, like have families now and they can't go. But when you get on a trip, you meet people who are kind of like minded and yeah, they just want to go and try things and, and chase life that little bit, which is great. So come here, since Machu Picchu then, you've kind of gone, you've you've done a lot of trips, a lot of bigger, harder trips. Like tell us the the highlights reel of what you've done since. As you go on these trips and even speaking with the guides and even from that first trip with you, John, like just speaking to you about things you've done and there was a couple of people, there was, uh, Alexia had been on that trip. She had travelled at that point. She had been all over the world and um, it just made me realise that like no matter what else happened, I was going to try and prioritise myself to get on as many of these trips as I could as was feasible. Um, so I did end up going um, about six months later I signed up and I went to Kilimanjaro it was a really really good trip as well that was actually another Pat Tivoli one yeah so that again the same more of the same just a great trip well organised really really cool people on that trip as well so we ended up a few of us doing um, we got into adventure racing after that ended up doing I think maybe seven or eight really long distance adventure races with that crew so we would train for a couple of months and uh, all meet up and have weekends away long after the trip was over you know it's really really good yeah cool and then you went to base camp as well yeah base camp I did last year I did Elbrus last August as well <laughs> I just realized when I'm saying it out loud <laughs> yeah no it's Dibble. great <laughs> a little devil <laughs> Yeah, Stuck Angry is probably my favorite trip of all, all the trips we run. Obviously, I was supposed to be there um, doing a new mountain in Ladakh called Kanyati. But obviously, with the pandemic, we couldn't go, but we're running it again next year. I think that area is like, for me, the best place in the world to go to go hiking. Did you enjoy Ladakh? Did you like like hiking out there? You know what I really loved about Ladakh, um, Jam? Like, so I couldn't pick which trip I like best, but one thing that really sticks out in my mind about Ladakh is how remote and beautiful and clean and it, the whole thing was it was a real mountain experience it was the first time I was ever say at a proper base camp um, and we camped out for almost I think we camped out for all of that trip all those little wild camps beside little rivers and we, you know it was it was beautiful I, I really liked it yeah um, and the mountain itself was um, that was probably the highest that was my highest point at the time. And I remember being like so excited because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do that one or not, you know? Yeah. I wasn't sure. Like, I mean, you're always nervous. Like you, you say you're going for the journey and you're going for the trip. But obviously, like if you've spent nine months preparing for something, you really want to try and make some of it if you can. And um, I was so excited when I got that one. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was so good. Yeah, I remember chatting to you after your kitty trip where you didn't summit and then you were like, you're asking me for advice on whether you should do Stuck Angry with you or Summit. And I was like 100% go and do it, you know, because we all have um, experiences where we don't make the uh, top of a mountain. Like I had an, an unsuccessful uh, summit attempt on Stuck Angry back in 2004 myself, first time I was out in Ladakh, but I've went back to climb it a few times. But talk to us about that emotion. Like how did it feel not to summit Killy? Like how, where, where was your head at after that? Oh, Jam, that was awful. And you know what, it was actually so bad because it was the first time I ever tried to do, like, say, a high altitude mountain. So I know we did, like, um, Machu Picchu was kind of a little bit smaller, but I was actually really heartbroken after it. And I guess I was never expecting not to get to the top. I just, the, in my opinion, like, I didn't see there was a way that I wasn't because I trained so hard and I was I was so sure of it, like. But, I mean, a couple of things happened on the day that probably would never happen again. And that was down to maybe an experience on my part. 
And I was heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken. But like, I was just very unwell on the night. And like, I think when you speak to people maybe who have never been to Alshi before and they say, you were how close to the top? And you didn't keep going. And you say, it's not like that. On the, at the, <laughs> it doesn't play out like that. You know, sometimes you just actually can't go on. But I felt so sad for myself coming down that mountain. <laughs> um, but I think then, like, the other side of it is, um, it made me kind of have a good look at, like, what, what was I doing the trips for? And it had me sit down and think, well, you know, are you prepared to have that? Like, because, it, like, I wouldn't give back Kitty for the world because I had the best trip ever. So then I had to say to myself, well, look, you're going to take on this 6,000 metre peak in the Himalayas. you got to sit down, first of all, and say, are you super happy to do the trip? to train for it, enjoy the run-up, enjoy the connection, enjoy the experience. If you don't get to the top, are you going to take it on the chin and just, you know, be okay with it? And I think that's what I learned was that, like, you know, you're going out here for one thing and obviously you're training like a boss to try and get to the top. But yeah, you know, on the day, things happen. You just, you know, you don't always get to the top. Sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But guess what? It just made that 6,000 metre song that's so much sweeter, you know? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It can be a really good learning process because it kind of makes you look at it, all your prep and... I think when you when you summit these mountains, like you, you're kind of like sweet. You're obviously feeling on top of the world, like you're you're ready for anything. But uh, I think we just learned so much more from a failed summit attempt. I like the fact that you said that it makes you kind of reassess why you're climbing mountains, and you know if you actually want to do it, if you're doing it for the, for the right reasons. Like, what is it that attracts you to mountains? I love the preparation. And the more I do, the more I learn. So like, what, like I've been on a couple of trips with um, your guide, John Healy. Yeah. I learned so much about how to care for myself on the mountain. And that's what made the difference, I think, when I went on to do subsequent trips after, say, the Kitty one. So like I made a few um, decisions on that mountain that I would never make again. And that was just due to maybe an experience. And I, I think every time you do another trip, you learn a little bit more about how you respond, what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, and then you also learn that sometimes there are things that are just out of your control, be it somebody, some, if something happens within the group or weather, like, you know, sometimes there's actually just very that you can do. I quite like challenges and I quite like, I like the whole idea of crisis management. So sometimes if things go a little bit wrong, there's something in me jam that quite likes saying, okay, well, here's where we're at now. Now, where do we go from here? So I don't want an easy ride to the top. <laughs> I don't want it to always be plain sailing. So I quite enjoy the challenge. But um, yeah, like that, the, the, you know, it's, it's a nice distraction for me when I'm working so hard and I'm being a mom. It's lovely to have, say, a, a countdown to a trip lay out a little training plan, get back in with the trainer, start getting the fitness up again, take out a few of the boozy nights, ditch some of the chocolate and just get yourself feeling well. And then you obviously know you're going away with a group of like really cool people. Mm. And um, that's always just something really nice to look forward to. So yeah, I just, I love the whole process. Yeah. Yeah, fair play to you, dude. You're like, just just as you as you went through it there, like all the different mountains. Talk to me about Elbrus. Like, how, how was that tough? How, how did you go there? I really, really loved Elbrus. I had the best trip. Do you know what I would say about Elbrus is that it was a, it was a surprise trip for me because some parts of me just wanted to kind of tick a box and do that mountain. I and mean, that's a bit of a lousy thing to say about a mountain. But if I'm honest, it was it was more that the time of year for that particular peak suited my the logistics of my year and planning my trip. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll do it. So it wasn't like one of the ones that I was dying to get to. Russia ended up like blowing my mind. Like when we stopped, we did um, Moscow on the way back. Those few days was epic. You know, it was a tough mountain. It was a tough mountain, but I trained so hard for it. Like I carried a ton of weight from months before I went out. So I actually was kind of proud of myself when I got out there. I was like, I want to say it was 11 guys and myself on that trip. <laughs> so um, I, I was so conscious of that as well, but like, I didn't want to go out and be like, look at Debbie at the back, dragging the bag. And I just wanted to be kind of feeling strong a bit. And I trained really hard for it. And I ended up having a really good summer day. I felt really strong all the time. Didn't feel sick, which is really unusual for me because I usually turn a funny shade of green somewhere along the way. But um, yeah, and the guys that are there were brilliant. Again, John Healy led that trip. It was, it was a really successful expedition. I loved it. Yeah. I was actually supposed to go there myself this summer and because I haven't been since... I think four or five years since we changed the itinerary. So I've only climbed it from the south side. So for the listeners, like most people go up Elbrus from the south side, which means you're taking kind of man-made transport. So you take a chairlift 
and then a cable car and a, and a peace machine up to 4,700 uh, meters. And then you have a 900 meter hike to the top, which is still tough, but we changed the itinerary about two, three years ago. And now we go from the north side, which means you have to walk all the way to the top. That's the way Debbie went up. But the big difference is it's much wilder on that side. There's no man-made infrastructure. So basically the summit day is a 1900 meter elevation gain, which is absolutely massive. So uh, yeah, kudos to you. Good, good job on that one. Like fair play to you and everyone who's flying there from that side or, you know, even on the south side. But yeah, it's, it's a nicer itinerary. Like what's it like being on a trip? Like is the only female like or the only girl or yeah. How do you find that like? Do you know what? It was actually 150% fine. Maybe if this was like trip number one and I'd never done an Earth's Edge trip before, I might have been, I might, maybe I wouldn't have been as confident going out, but I had been on two expeditions previously with John Healy, the guide. And then at this point, I've done quite a few Earth's Edge expeditions. So I know how they run. There's never a problem that's not solvable. And I actually had spoken to my very good friend, Katrina, who had done the expedition the year previously. And I think she was on that trip also as a solo female. And she had totally put my mind at rest that everything was fine. And um, I actually really enjoyed it because the guys were very, very cool. And like I worked in the bars for years, Jam. And for me to, I suppose, the chatting and that stuff was totally fine. I was nervous that I was going to be paddy last and that I was going to get left behind. But that was never going to happen, you know. And I was trying to be there taking care of me. But um, yeah, no, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Like we stayed in contact and yeah, the guys were pretty cool. We um, often hear from people like who are like concerned to sign up to trip solo, like are apprehensive about signing up by themselves, especially women, to be honest. Like, is it ever anything that like crossed your mind, like on any of the trips in particular, your first one is like, oh, I'm going to go by myself. Like, did that emotion come across for you? You know, I'm actually glad you kind of touched on this because it was something that entered my mind. Like, so I was thinking about podcasts and things that might come up. And one, that is one thing that I, I think I find myself speaking to females. A lot of girls um, or women would message me sometimes because they'd see they might be tagged in something from an Earth's Edge trip and ask me, how was it? Did I go on my own? I kind of don't remember feeling super nervous because it wouldn't be maybe in my nature, but I do appreciate that a lot of females would have that apprehension, you know, about going. The one thing I can say is whatever you're going to worry about, don't worry about that aspect because every trip I've been on, it's it's nearly always mostly single people anyway for a start. And then if you get a couple of couples, what about it? Like they're always bunch of sounders really you know but um I just always found that no matter what came up on these trips and things do come up I always found that the guys were able to just very quietly just have a word if there was something you know for example maybe a snoring tent mate or <laughs> because I don't know if there was ever anything I always found that it was all an easy fix but yeah I would advise anyone who's worrying about that not for even one second just to really uh yeah put that out of your mind and just go for it Let's take a break there for some quick fire questions. So, Debbie, are you ready for the quick fire round? I am indeed, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> what was your first job? Cleaning boats on the Celtic Canal cruisers in Captain Car. <laughs> nice, that's cool. What song is always on your workout playlist? Anything by Eminem. What are you reading right now? Oh, I can't pronounce a Japanese panchinko. What's that about? It's basically about war-torn Korea, Japan, kind of a love story, kind of a sad story. But yeah, just getting into it. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. If you were stranded on a mountain with one celebrity, who would it be? Oh, Bradley Cooper. Nice. <laughs> I didn't have to think too hard about that. What's your favorite food to eat on a mountain? Mars bars. Mars bars, okay, cool. What's your favorite piece of kit? Um, you know I have a shiwi, but I'm hardly going there now with my favourite piece of kit. <laughs> I don't know that you have a shiwi. It's like everyone's talking about it. You know, Debbie, she's got a shiwi. Yeah, no, I do have a shiwi. Not my favourite piece of kit. I would say probably my sleeping bag. What's your biggest pet peeve when travelling? Shiwi. <laughs> <laughs> if money wasn't a factor, what would you do all day? Work out, eat nice food, take nice trips. Not too dissimilar to what you, so you do some of your time at the moment. Okay, and finally, describe yourself in three words. Happy, ambitious, fun. <laughs> yeah. 
So come here, you strike me as someone who likes to work hard and play hard. Tell us about your lifestyle and like what makes you tick. Like from talking to you there, your training, like you seem to be kind of, you need to have a, an expedition to be working towards and you're just so busy at work. Like, like, yeah, talk to me about that, you know? Generally, I do like a good balance. You know, it, it can get a little bit crazy. It comes down to taking time away to realize I probably would have a tendency to work maybe too much and work too hard and there's something I suppose sometimes you can just be a little bit like always look into the next thing or and that's just part of my I suppose my personality and um, I think I'm just maybe it's as well I'm getting a little bit older I just try and slow slow down a little bit you know and um, enjoy the littler things and yeah I'm, I'm, I'm finding that more and more as I do the trips and more and more as I take time away from work like work is not so important all the time like I still need that break away to come back all guns blazing and then just take a step back then again yeah I find myself like sometimes because I guess I kind of have two jobs I'm, I'm running a small business but then I'm also going away uh, leading trips and guiding I, I know it's for all for earth's edge but they're completely different roles and I used to guide full time, you know, like um, around the year before I started the business. I don't think I could do that anymore, but I also couldn't work in the office um, full time. I would find that super hard. Are you apprehensive about leaving your business for like two, three weeks at a time? Or do you find that pretty easy? How does that go for you? It's basically a non-negotiable. I don't worry about it. I have an amazing team in place. I'm really, really lucky. There's obviously times, you know, at the last minute, you know, that last few days before you go on a trip and you just seem to have like 65 million things to do. But um, as soon as I get away, I disconnect as much as possible. And I'm lucky I have a couple of um, really good managers and then the team's quite strong. So I try my best to actually disconnect from the business, which be it the right thing or the wrong thing. For me, it's just a non-negotiable. Like I, I, I just see it as like I work very, very hard um, when I'm, on duty and I'm on social media a lot like uh, I do work out of hours so when I do go away I just want absolutely nothing <laughs> to do with it. work and uh, yeah I think it's important definitely I think when I leave when I'm away from the office they actually they get a lot more done there's less you know they can just do their jobs without me annoying them or asking <laughs> them to do really? <laughs> um, it's not that surprising really is it to um, so talk to me about your bucket list mountains like where where do you want to go next like I did, um, I spent three weeks on Aconcagua and uh, I did it with a girl that I met on an Earth's Edge trip and um, I wanted to do it actually with your company but the time didn't suit me and I ended up going with my friend to do that mountain. Uh, I think it was three years ago, we went out in January, January 30, uh, December 31st we flew out. Absolutely loved the mountain, just absolutely loved South America. But we were unsuccessful and I would love to go back and do it. I said that to uh, John, I think I'd like to go back and do it with Earth's Edge. We didn't summit on that mountain, but it's more that I think I'd like to just go back. I feel like there was, I'd like to spend more time in that area, right? So that's one that I would like to do. Um, And somewhere down the line, I'd like to do Denali, possibly. Nice. (laughs) Who knows when, John, you know, who knows when. I mean, I've started to do a little bit of traveling that's not completely um, mountain related, which, you know, is nice too. We went to Thailand um, Christmas. We were due to go to Bali for the summer. So, um, yeah, I just want to kind of mix it up a little bit. But, yeah, I definitely think I'd like to go back to Nakagawa and really love to do Denali at some point. Yeah. 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 You should do it. Why not? Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> I should. <laughs> yeah, I think you were you were mentioned somewhere um, earlier on in the podcast. Um, you were talking about making sure that you climb mountains for the right reasons. And I can really yeah. relate to that. You know, I think it's good to have rather than have four or five, six mountains in, in your in your uh, in your horizon. I think it's to have one climb that or attempt to climb it and then come back and Maybe not straight away, because if you decide straight away, you're like, I'm never climbing a mountain again. But after a couple of weeks or a month, going to go, OK, yeah, I really did enjoy that in hindsight and then go for another one. You know, um, I know from my own experience, like like from about nine to 25, 26, all I did was was kayak. And my whole mission was just to find harder and harder rivers in different parts of the world and just keep pushing it. And probably from 22 for that four year period, I really didn't enjoy it, you know, and I just associated myself as a kayaker. So it kept going on. it. So it took me, um, I kept doing that for much longer than I should have. So I think that's a really good idea to to just take him one mountain at a time. We get people in touch, like asking us, I want to climb Everest. Like, how do I do that? And, you know, you're like, okay, okay. maybe <laughs> start with something a little smaller first and, and see if you like it. And then if you, if you, you know, cause you have to, you have to really enjoy 
a bit of hardship, especially when you're talking about something like Aconcagua. It's a seven, just under seven thousand meters. It's it's a beast. It's yeah, a, beast. It's a, a lot of pain. You know, you're you're basically uh, a high altitude porter really on that mountain. But yeah, it's but it, you know it's a wild mountain, and I mean I do remember the first time I was ever probably kind of scared on a mountain was when I was on Aconcagua and I loved it. It was like, it was, we got really, really bad weather. I think it was the first time I was ever like just lying in the tent and the wind was, it was really, really strong. I don't know how high it was, but like the tent was just whipping and both Katrina and I were like playing it cool. Like, I'm not scared. You're scared? You're not scared. No. <laughs> I do remember going, God, what am I doing? <laughs> but like you have those moments, you know, and the thing about it is it was an epic, epic mountain. So it was, it was just a taste, I suppose. It gave me a taste for the, the harder, higher stuff. Maybe. Once you get up to those bigger mountains, you know, it's, you're really, really so weather dependent. When I was in Aconcagua a few years ago, we had a, a successful trip, but there was another team kind of two days before us. And uh, when they went up to the six, the high camp, camp three, it's 6,000 meters. They left for, for summit. And after like two hours, they had to turn around and come back because wind had come through to high camp, a gust and just blown away all 30 tents. So their, their summit attempt was abandoned because there'd be nowhere for them to sleep after they came down. Doesn't even surprise me. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, no. Yeah. Like 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 most mountains, they can be super chill and, and then they can just turn around and, and just go crazy, you know? So yeah, I was actually going to ask you, tell us a little bit more about that. I want to know what your scariest or toughest moment on a mountain was. So, Oh, <laughs> I had one mishap. Um, I had a mishap on Stock Hangry, which kind of just put the willies up me for a little bit. Um, on Summit Night, um, so obviously you leave, it's dark. I, I, I want to say we left at maybe midnight or one o'clock. I, I, I can't remember, but it was dark. And yeah, you pretty much start walking. If I'm not mistaken, you're pretty much in crampons, maybe straight away. But anyway, yeah, um, we're kind of going up the, the steeper section. We're maybe about halfway in. And my crampon came off and slipped <laughs> and broke, actually, it snapped. And uh, yeah, I started to slide <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is how it ends. <laughs> because I just couldn't seem to like get my grip. And it was all happened. It all happened like, damn, in like 20 seconds. But I just felt like, oh God, I'm never going to stop here. <laughs> and every single uh, like Everest movie that I'd seen people sliding off sides and <laughs> <laughs> it was flashing in my head. It probably was like, it probably wasn't even a steep angle. It probably just felt really a lot scarier than it was. But I do remember that. But uh, actually, one of the porters uh, was able to retrieve my um, crampon. John Healy being John Healy just sat everybody down. And I don't know what he had in the backpack. He had some, I'm pretty sure it wasn't an actual tool, but he had something on his own crampon. Anyway, he started doing his MacGyver act and he fixed my crampon for me. So I was able to continue on, which was excellent because it would have been really, really crappy if that was the reason I didn't get to the top that night. But yeah, that was a bit hairy, but I think actually scared. I've never been, I've never been actually terrified on the mountain, but yeah, the, the, the weather on Aconcagua just gave me, just woke me up a little bit, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. So you, you guys on Aconcagua, you had bad weather that made that, that basically forced you guys to abandon your summit attempt. It wasn't necessarily that on summit night it was very stormy. Actually, summit night was when we had started out. It actually wasn't too bad, but it was just it was more the case where the weather was so poor they had to take a lot of our up and down our tentization days from the schedule, which meant like for somebody like me, I was never going to be able to just keep going camp one, camp two, camp three. I just ran out of steam. So the weather wasn't too bad on summer day. It was windy, but it just meant that we had lost two days of acclimatization. So it just meant that we were all like, we were shagged basically. We got 6,000 meters or 6'2", the high camp is. Yeah. Spent a couple of hours there. It was, it was, I was kind of brown bread. Even when I got into that camp, like we lay there for a few hours. We weren't really able to do a whole pile. There wasn't a whole pile of talking, eating, drinking, very little. Um, and then we got dressed around one or two o'clock. So there was eight on our group. Um, and I think three of us got dressed and the others decided not to go on and three of us got dressed and went out and um, yeah, we, I think I didn't even make it to, what's the, the, I just stopped before the cave, what's it called? Oh, the um, Canaletta. Yeah, so I didn't, I was there, I, I didn't make it even to Canaletta. Um, my guide was, he did his best, but he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't John Healy like, you know. He said, you know, at this speed that you're There's moving, only one John Healy. There's only one John Healy like, there is like. <laughs> but yeah, the guide kind of, I, I, I probably, I wasn't, 
I probably could have went on a little bit more if I had a bit more encouragement. But at this point, it was just me and the guy. He was not in the humor of going any further. I was walking really, really slow. And he just said, look, you're not going to make it to the top at this speed. Um, you should probably go down. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't take much convincing that day. So, um, But it was it was a very cool mountain. Like it was, it was the longest I'd ever spent camping. It was the coldest I'd ever been. And like the most extreme temperatures and weather. And I, I still loved it, you know. I still yeah. went back for more. <laughs> You're going back for more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, flipping it back to partying as well, like if you've come off an expedition somewhere like Russia or Kyrgyzstan and, you know, it's like you're you're going for a meal at the end to celebrate a, a good trip, like, you know, you're getting buckwheat or warm lager or in yeah. Kyrgyzstan we drink like mare's milk. Um, Mendoza is just the best place in the world to, to come off a mountain because, you know, you're you're drinking the best of wine and, and eating steak and, yeah, it's just such a great place. I love Argentina. It's an amazing, amazing country. Amazing, and the weather was beautiful. It's just at that, that like it, when we came down, it was like it was high twenties, but no humidity. Like you're a thousand meters, you're already a thousand meters altitude. It was absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, probably one of my favorite cities actually that I've ever visited. Um, Mendoza, I loved it. Yeah, I'm interested to talk to you about training a little bit. What's your like baseline? Let's say before, if you don't have a trip planned, and then how do you ramp that up to a big expedition? Like, how would your typical week of training change as as you get closer to a big trip? I suppose I'm only just realizing how much I used to do because I've been trying to like pick pace again to what I was doing last year. So I, I would keep a log of everything that I do. Um, and I did work out with a trainer. Um, so for example, I would work out with my trainer three days a week and he would do strength work with me. And that was basically to stop me getting injured because I would suffer with kind of a dodgy knee and a hip. I found when I did that work with him, it was he was inclined to kind of just make sure that my form was good. And he just did a lot of the really basic um, strengthening um, exercises, so your deadlifts and your squats and all that stuff. And that was literally just to have strong legs and to be in injury free. The closer you get to the trip or the closer I get to the trip, I tend to start bringing in a lot more cardio. So stuff like spinning, I, I found spinning actually excellent. I did Maybe I started spinning in January before the expedition to um, Everest base camp in April. And then I continued my training for Russia for Everest last August. And I think that I felt really, really strong in that mountain. And, and I noticed that, that, say, for that particular block of training, I had a lot more spinning in it than maybe running, um, which I had ran a lot more on the previous, say, Brack and Cag, but I think I was actually brown bread by the time I, I trained for my first marathon in preparation for Akin okay. and uh, I actually think I was nearly I, was, I, I almost think I maybe overtrained a little bit for Akin I know that probably sounds a bit crazy but I was actually nearly too, too tired going out and then it just depends on whether I'm carrying a load or not so for both Elbrus and for Akin I literally just went out into the Irish hills and carried um, a large you know, my large backpack that I was going to use on expedition and I would use you know the five gallon drums of water yeah, yeah? So I would fill those Build them up. So start with 10 kg, which is two bottles, then up to three and then up to four. And I would generally like go up and down and just kind of empty the water at the top of the mountain so that I wasn't like wrecking my knees all the time coming down. I found that that kind of covered all bases. So yeah, uh, running, cycling, and then actually you know, walking and then just a bit of strength work or Pilates just to make sure I wasn't um, sore or aching um, on the mountain. And it worked really well. Yeah. That sounds really good. Like, especially. Uh when you're well into your thirties, like uh, you and I are Debbie, you know, I think the strength work is so key. You know, I have a dodgy hip and a dodgy knee myself. And the thing I like to say to people is, you know, just build your training volume really slowly because what I see quite a bit is people putting a lot of volume on and then getting injured and stopping and then having to start again. So bring it up uh, really slowly and carrying a, a loaded bag in the Irish Hills is I think essential for me um, you don't need to do it when you first start but to build up to be able to carry 20 kg in the Irish mountains is is so important because you need that confidence that you can do it at sea level before you go out to high altitude I think that's what it is like I think for big mountain like Elbrus or Aconcagua it can often be a mental game as much as anything else so if you know I've done a good training program I have the right gear I'm fit enough to carry this weight, then you're you're just in that positive um, frame of mind, and you're you're in a really good position to have a a, a good attempt at the, at the crack of the mountain. You know, I just it's very important, I think, for people to know that you don't have to be genetically predisposed to be super super fit. What if you, if you're not inclined to be, you know, always out playing sports and that, if you do actually commit the, to the training and try and like as you you just hit the nail on the head, 
don't try and do it three, six months before the trip. Like if you're going to do a trip like this, give yourself at least nine months. I, in my opinion, you need, I need at least nine months when I know I'm doing something big. And just break it down because you've all these weekends, like life gets in the way. And next thing you might pick up a bit of an injury, you could be off for a couple of weeks or whatever. And you, you just don't want to be like coming up on a big trip and then panicking and saying, maybe I don't have it. And like, it's very rewarding. I, I, I love the whole process and I love how I can see month by month recording how much stronger I'm getting. And knowing that like, God, there's no way three months ago I would have carried that pack for X amount of hours up that mountain. And now I did it today and I didn't die. <laughs> it's always good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, come here before we finish, if you were chatting to someone like who's thinking about doing their first like Kilimanjaro trip, like what top tip would you give them? Like what are top tips even would you give them? Top tips. Just book it. Do a bit of training. Get your checklist out. Get your few bits together and go on away and have a great time with yourself. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. I think people grow us enemy questions. People ask me this, ask me that. And I, I get that you do need like, to have a good understanding, but the training weekends are brilliant. Go on the training weekend. Listen to what the instructors say. Don't pack too much crap. You don't need a hair straighteners on Kitty. I repeat, you do not need your hair straighteners <laughs> on Kitty. <laughs> like, damn, I know how many times I went to trips with girls and listen I love a belt lip gloss on the mountain as much as anyone but you yeah like you please don't overpack you'll actually ruin your trip because you're going to be constantly worrying and you're going to fit everything in and fit everything out and like the one thing is when you do start to feel if you do start to feel a little bit unwell in altitude like the energy that it takes to get your bag packed and stuff in the morning if you're not feeling really really uh, energetic like it's an effort so you want to kind of have things really simple for yourself have the bag so that it's big enough to put everything in know how to decompress your thermal rest before you go because the, the leader of the trip might make an absolute show of you <laughs> and make fun of you if you don't know how to do it yeah. <laughs> not pointing at anyone in particular but yeah uh, just yeah just go and do it it's amazing that's awesome dude well listen come here Rick. really great chatting to you thanks Miller, for coming on the podcast uh, thanks for having me. This podcast was produced by Earth's Edge. We're a small business based in Ireland who organize big adventures all over the world. For more information about us and the trips discussed on this podcast, visit earths-edge.com or follow us on Instagram. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list to be in the running to win one of our summit jackets. There's a link in the show notes. And while you're there, if you could subscribe and review the podcast, that'd be brilliant. I'm your host, James McManus. Thanks for listening and have a super week.